Grip. Progressive rock is a prison. If you walk on stage and you start playing music, fine. But if you're walking on stage and playing progressive rock, death. In 2019, in a Rolling Stone interview, he spoke about his global quest for his band, King Crimson, to break out of the male prog rock ghetto. So, I guess from those comments, you could say Robert doesn't like the terms progressive rock stroke prog. But I would argue that Robert is probably the most progressive rock musician I have ever come across. I can see why Robert does not want to be associated with the prog label. Prog today has become a musical cul-de-sac. Five, ten, twenty minute long pieces often seeming much longer, packed with odd time signatures, endless, endless noodling, slowly disappearing up its own inflated pompous backside. Not so much in search for lost called, more desperately seeking some, any inspiration. When it started, I loved progressive rock. When it started way back, what is it, uh, 68, 69, I loved it. Bands taking chances, exploring new territories, a brave new world. Bands blended together jazz, rock, blues, folk, medieval influences, and many others, into a heady brew. The best combined these with dazzling virtuosity. We were taken close to the edge. We visited the dark side of the moon. We walked in the court of the Crimson King, saw passion plays, sold England by the pound, and got home just in time as supper was ready. Like I said, it was groundbreaking, exciting for a few years. And then by 1980, for me, it had all kind of ground to a halt. Emerson Lake and Palmer got marooned on a love beach. Yes, split up and reformed, then split up and reformed so many times you needed a wall chart just to keep up. Jethro Tull, after abandoning progressive rock, full-blown progressive rock after a passion play and searching around for a few albums, then embraced a sort of progressive folk to the end of the 1980s. But after that, they never again achieved the artistic heights or popularity they enjoyed in the 1970s. Genesis slowly evolved into a hugely successful pop rock band with hints of prog. Strangely enough, the band who enjoyed the most commercial success in the 1970s were Pink Floyd, who in the early 70s were famed for their out there experimental space rock jams and drifting hippie psychedelia. They managed to compress all of that into a more radio friendly commercial style, complete with soaring harmonies, killer guitar solos and superb songs. Now Fripp and his band King Crimson who had kind of kick-started the whole genre. They'd kind of given a template for the whole genre with their first album in the court of the Crimson King. Marched to the beat of a very different drum and pursued a very different course to the bands that I have just mentioned. But we'll get to that in a bit. First off, I'd like to explore Fripp's early days and his path to King Crimson. At age 11, he was bought as a present an acoustic hope I pronounce this okay, Manguin Freire guitar. Acoustic Manguin Freire guitar. Robert, it was virtually impossible to press down a note above the fifth fret. It crippled my guitar playing, but developed a musculature that took me many years to control, as well as a guitar that he could barely play comfortably. Robert was, by his own admission, tone deaf and had no sense of rhythm whatsoever. Also, you have to add in that he was left-handed, but played the instrument right-handed. After about three months of playing, he went to take guitar lessons from a piano teacher who couldn't actually play guitar, but it did give him a background in musical theory. After this, Fripp took some lessons from Don Strike, who had extensive knowledge of 20s and 30s style music. And as he moved through his teens, Robert played in various jazz and rock and roll bands, citing Scotty Moore, Charlie Parker and Charles Mingus as influences. But the key thing back in those days was practice, practice and more practice. Fripp found these playing exercises designed to improve his speed. Robert Fripp, daily practice and not just going through the licks that you know, but going through proper exercises 
is important if anything is important. Fripp, you must develop ability so you can follow the music wherever it goes. But also you must not get hung up on technical ability, but rather you should use it to further expression. At 21 years old, Robert was now a professional musician and he found himself playing light jazz in the Majestic Dance Orchestra at Bournemouth's Majestic Hotel. Fripp, I spent a long time wondering why it was that such an unlikely candidate would become a professional musician, but I knew right away that I was going to earn a living from it. Thinking about it over the years, I guess music has a desire to be heard, such a kind of compulsion to be heard that it picks on unlikely candidates to give it voice. Around about that time, at age 21, he was coming home very late at night and he turned on Radio Luxembourg and he heard the last moments of A Day in the Life by the Beatles. He said that this experience terrorised him but also galvanised him and he went on to listen to Sgt Pepper, Bella Bartok, String Quartets, Vorjak's New World Symphony, Hendrix and John Mayall and the Blues Breakers. Many years later, Fripp would recall that although the dialects were different, the voice was the same. I knew I couldn't say no. In 1967, Fripp answered an advertisement placed by Peter and Michael Giles. They were looking for a singing organist. Although Fripp was not an organist, he got the job. The trio relocated to London and recorded one album, the cheerful insanity of Giles, Giles and Fripp. Now, this is very much a product of 1968. It's laced with Monty Python's, Goons, Pete and Dad humour, and a bunch of excellent psychedelic and very eccentric songs. If you like early Floyd, the Sid Barrett era, Small Faces, Ogden's Nut Gone Flake, Sci-Fi Sorrow by The Pretty Things, you're going to love this. It's very much that English psychedelic rock. But the added bonus on this is Fripp's already exceptional guitar playing. Jazzy fluid runs, sweet callings and lots of psychedelic distortion where needed. Personally though, I prefer the Blondesbury tapes. There are a series of demos made, I'm guessing, before Giles, Giles and Fripp and after. The later demos featuring Judy Dybal and Ian MacDonald. These demos, even more so than the recorded album, show an embryonic band bursting with talent and potential. However, after that first album, which I think sold 500 to 600 copies, not a success, the band broke up and the remaining members morphed into what was to become King Crimson. Peter Giles left, leaving Michael Giles, Fripp and Ian MacDonald and they recruited Greg Lake as lead singer and bassist and McDonald's friend Pete Sinfield as lyricist. The first time I saw Fripp and King Crimson was at some small club in London in 69. They just appeared on stage. They just plugged in and hit you right between the eyes. 21st century schizoid man. No warm up, no tuning up. Bang. Like I said, right between the eyes. Brutal, visceral heavy metal with jazz chops and a singer Greg Lake with the voice of an angel and a guitarist who sat down. To say it was a shock to the system would be an understatement. One minute you'd have this avant-garde jazz then it would verge into like I said brutal heavy heavy rock. Then you'd have these quiet pastoral passages laced with Mellotron creating this almost symphonic background. Up to then I'd never heard a Mellotron live. It was an eerie experience. Yes, at the time we had great bands, we had the Stones, we had the Who, Tull, but nothing like this. Hendrix called the band back then the best band in the world. And I guess up until they split, I think late 1969, they were. They were absolutely amazing. And when their first album came out in 1969, October 1969, you could feel the shockwaves reverberate amongst the musical community. There was nothing else quite like it. Now for the next two parts in the Robert Fripp King Crimson story, please go and listen to our video. I'll put a link, our videos 
I'll put a link for both of them in the description. The Rise and Fall of Progressive Rock Part 1, King Crimson, and Robert Fripp, 1974 to 1979. I'll take up the story again from 1979 onwards in the next video. Now just one last thing before I go. A lot of people think that after King Crimson's first album, in the court of the Crimson King, the band went through a kind of very strange period and it's not really the best period of King Crimson. Well, I would say go and listen to the live album. It's on YouTube, Ladies of the Road, to get a really, uh, to get a really good view of what this band was actually doing back then in those years before the great Lark's Tongues in Aspic, Starless and Bible Black and Red. It's a wonderful document, and like I say, you might be a little bit surprised. Take care, God bless, see you in the next video.